So we started talking about hypothesis testing, and the idea is that this is um, so this is one of the basic um, like um, I guess ideas um, behind decision theory. So Wald's original proposition is around 1920 or like maybe 30 that you can view all the like different problems like estimation and hypothesis testing that seem to be different under this umbrella of decision theory. So there's not much difference between hypothesis testing and um, um, estimation if you read it that way. Although, um, so the composite version of the simple version where, where, so again, so the setting is that we have these um, parametric um, um, probability models for some observation. In the simple hypothesis testing, the, the parameter space just has two um, elements, binary elements. And you already know techniques to deal with it. So you can do, for example, Bayesian analysis. So you can put a prior on the two parameters and calculate the, the base optimal rule. You can do that. So the base optimal rule turns out to be under the zero one loss would be like MAP, maximum A posteriority, like A posteriority like decision rule. Uh, you can do minimax. We already did some kind of minimax for the Bernoulli case, if you remember. So you can do minimax hypothesis testing. So the simple case really boils down to like the cases that we have seen before. So the, the more interesting one is where we have um, um, these composite cases. Um, although in the, like the simple case, there is still um, like more refined analysis. So instead of doing, um, so let's say, worrying about a particular loss function, there is, because there's like in the simple case, there are basically two numbers, whether you, um, they call false positive rate and negative, they call false positive rate or like two positive rate or false positive rate and uh, false negative rate, if you want. So there are these two numbers that, that are in tension and you can um, try to balance the two out. And without like worrying about the loss, you can sort of get a, like a complete picture of the um, story. And so that's where we are headed. Um, that would be due to, that leads to this name and here some sort of um, lemma uh, or name and here some framework of looking at hypothesis testing. And then you can try to generalize that to see if you can do composite, okay, the composite cases. So the setting is that I have, again, X, the observations from P theta, uh, and then theta either lies in this omega naught, which is the null hypothesis, or omega one, which is the alternative hypothesis. And uh, you're looking for a decision rule, which is gonna be just, you can say an estimator, or in this case, it's often called a test, um, instead of calling an estimator, it's a test. And it's, it's sort of gonna output a decision, either one or zero. Zero means we're under the null, one means we are on, under the alternative. And for deterministic rules, um, a test or a decision rule is completely determined by the region of the sample space on which you declare one. So that S um, is what determines the rule. So there's like a one-to-one -one mapping between tests and sets. So this set is sometimes called critical region. And so we have to like specify that. Um, so for example, when you flip a coin, you have to decide, let's say you want to base your decision on the average, you want to decide, let's say, if the coin, for example, is fair, you have to specify what ranges of that average you want to declare as fair, what ranges you don't. And so if delta x is equal to one, sometimes you say the accepted h1. Some people don't like that. I'm, 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 for simplicity, I'm going to say it. They, they, they would say reject the null. Um, so you never accept the alternative. You just see whether you can reject the null or not. But that terminology doesn't matter as much. We just we're gonna like decide whether you're under the null or under the alternative. And so there is this power function that describes the test completely, and um, that can be written as the expectation of this uh, test function, which is e equal to the probability. Uh, of x belonging to the critical region. So this is basically equivalent to saying probability under the theta that we sort of accept h1 or reject uh, h0. So this is a good thing. This is a good event if you're under the, the alternative. It's a bad event if you're under the null. So you want this power function to look like this. So um, if 
let's say this is omega one, this is omega naught. Uh, so you want it like to transition from round zero to something very close to one. Um, so you want to, the probability that you declare alternative under the alternative parameter is going to be uh, one or close to one. And um, under the null parameters, you want it to be zero or very close to zero. So the ideal test would be like this. So the power function would look like a, like a step function. Um, of course, in practice, you can't achieve this if there is some sort of an uncertainty in the problem. Um, but the question is how, how close we can get to something like that. So far, so good. Um, and then the um, there's going to be a trade-off. Um, so if you try, you can always like come up with a test that achieves like this is the, okay. This is called the power function. So you can always achieve a power of one over the alternative uh, by a very simple procedure. What is the simple procedure? If if I don't care about like then what happens under the null, I can always have like perfect power under the alternative. The dumbest thing that you can do. There are two dumbest things that you can do. Like, sorry? Always accept, yes, that would have like always power of one. So it would be great here, but very bad here. The other dumb thing that we can do is like always, not necessarily dumb always, so, always declare the alternative. They're always going to be like, okay, good, perfect under the alternative, like the no, but uh, the worst under the alternative. So these are the two extreme cases, and then you can try to trade off. If I try to, like, there are, sometimes I'm going to like deviate from, the, so start from declaring always one. Um, so you can see, like, we'll see this thing called the ROC. So this is, um, under the alternative, sometimes things are called, like, the, uh, so, so if you have two points, let's say um, omega naught is theta naught and omega one is theta one, I just have two values, beta theta naught and beta theta one. So beta theta one is uh, called the, uh, the true positive rate, um, TPR. The probability of declaring alternative under the alternative and uh, one minus beta, beta zero would be called false positive rate. So type one error, false positive rate. And so if, if you have a simple hypothesis testing, there are these two numbers. And what I described would be these two endpoints in this um, PPR versus FPR. Um, okay, so the one that always declares one has power of one. Every, like always, so you'd get um, um, false positive rate would be one. Uh, oh, sorry, this is this is going to be the zero. Sorry. Um, yeah, one, one. Sorry, one minus. Um, yeah, so that that would that one would have like this. This would be one. This would be. Uh, yeah, this would also be one. Uh, no, that didn't work. What would I want to say? Um, so let's say if, if you have positive rate, one minus beta, beta So so do do these two tests correspond to the points that I specify? So beta. So the x axis does beta of theta minus. Sorry. So then the x axis does beta of theta minus. Uh, no, that would be like one because beta. Uh, all right, 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 right. You're right. Great. That's that's the false positive rate because this is this is the probability of declaring uh, one on the other alternative. So yeah, then then you have one one and zero zero. Great. Um, this is this is an error basically. This is a good thing. Um, because beta is by by definition the probability of declaring one. Um. And then there's going to be a trade-off, and then you often like um, for any test, like actually for a family of tests, you would you would have like a, a region like this, um, and there's like an optimal curve like this. So there is there's there is a like um, the best that you can do at a given false positive rate 
and that's what we want to like discover okay so that that gives you the minimum Pearson framework this is the more general version so um this the significance level alpha is basically the worst the worst case of data over uh, omega naught so if there's just one parameter this would just be beta theta naught uh, this sometimes also called significance level um and the power of this would be really so that would be the power function the power of the test would be the smallest that this can get under omega y so if it's just one parameter then it's just going to be a number mm -hmm. so we want to minimize like maximize the name of here so our idea is maximize this subject to this being a, like a given value so suppose i um want the significance of all false positive rate to be like 0 0.05 uh, how how high can i go there okay if I like, if I allow myself to like fifty percent of the time be wrong, and if the false positive, I'm going to be here. How high can the power go? Okay, and the highest that it can go is like determined by by this um, question. Okay, so given a significance level, um, can we maximize um, the power? Okay. So once you have that, you can trace that curve, and nothing above this can be achieved. Okay, so anything above this is not possible. Anything below it is going to be possible. Um, and this gives you a nice, nice, nice picture. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, and for any, like, um, like we'll see, for, for any family of distribution, like for a family of tests, oftentimes you have a threshold. You can sort of um, vary and you trace a different curve here. So your, your curve might look like this for a family of uh, like tests. And then, then the, the, like the worst case is sort of this diagonal line. You may, may talk about that. Um, okay. So that's the name and Pearson framework. So um, sometimes we have to consider randomization. So we consider randomized tests. And um, in those cases, um, this, this is not going to be exactly one or zero, but the output of delta x would be the probability of the except one. So we're going to interpret the decision rule delta of x as the probability of the x sub h1 condition on observing x. So this, this probabilistic statement is relative to some external randomness that I can like hook up. So I just flip a coin, for example, or something else, like independent of my observations uh, and the data, the condition on the data um, it's some probability is sometimes like given any particular x, I could sometimes accept, sometimes re uh, reject, and the probability would, would be this. If you do this by the smoothing property, you can see that the power function still has that um, form. So this is still going to be the probability of acceptance. Uh, probability under theta of accept h1, because I can take the expectation of both sides of this. Um, so this power function still has that form. Um, okay, yeah. So, so what is the x in the previous slide? Is that like x or theta? Um, where? Like, like the power function beta theta equals the expectation, like, like the delta x. I, I, I'm referring to the x in the delta. Yes, yes, x is the observation. So you have an observation. So you observe something from this. And you make a decision which is delta x. Well, I suppose the critical region is a, like a, is a function of the. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the critical region is like is like the delta, the decision rule. So you specify the critical region like a region, and then whether x belongs to that or not, this oh. this thing is now a function of x. Okay. Right. That, that is usually specified by the family of distributions that you look at. Um, sounds good. Okay, so let's try to answer this question, name of fear sensor optimization. It's really an optimization problem. And um, so I can, I can formulate it in terms of the, um, um, in, in more like um, standard notations of, um, optimization as we'll see. Um, so simple hypothesis test, let's assume that uh, omega naught is uh, with the singleton set theta naught and then omega one is singleton set theta one. So the Neyman um, Pearson sort of optimization criteria or the problem reads like this, fix some alpha, you 
trying to, in this case, this is uh, like that beta theta one, that's the uh, true positive rate. And this is um, beta theta naught, which is the false positive rate. And so we're assuming that the false positive rate is at most alpha. So we're gonna look at decision rules for which um, the false positive rate is at most alpha, and then we try to maximize um, the power. So this is really a constraint optimization problem over the space of decision rules, okay? And um, Naaman Pearson sort of lemma says that the solution to this is the following decision rule. So it's um, um, basically the most power is achieved by the likelihood ratio test or likelihood ratio test. The test that looks like this, basically, um, if you ignore this part, ignore this part for now, um, it specifies the critical region as the likelihood ratio being bigger than tau. So likelihood ratio here, um, as you can see, um, I'm going to take the p theta one of x. That's the remember the likelihood is is this mapping from theta zero theta one to um, um, to basically real. So that's the like basically you can think of the likelihood function as this pair because in this case this function is just the two values for it. And the likelihood ratio is just the ratio of these values. Um, and so this gives you a statistic, which is the likelihood ratio. The statistic, and you threshold it. If this is bigger than tau, um, then I declare one alternative happen, or we are under the alternative. Otherwise, you're going to declare the null. Um, this extra piece here, so this is like, like compact way of writing one. If Lx is bigger than tau, zero if Lx is less than tau. Uh, but what if Lx is exactly equal to tau? Sometimes you have to randomize here. So there's this gamma here, which is between zero and one. We're going to flip a coin with this much probability and then decide. Um, whether you need this or not depends on the problem. We'll talk about that. Um, but if L of x has a continuous distribution, then you don't need that because this. Uh, will not happen. It, it could happen, happens with probability zero. Um, okay, so that's the result, uh, saying that um, the solution of the optimization problem or the so-called most powerful test, most powerful test uh, for a given significance level, which means that we have this constraint, um, is given by the um, likelihood ratio test. And the only thing that we have to specify is this tau, and this is specified by this alpha. So the alpha would determine this threshold. Um, state, the statement is clear. OK. Um, and then for, yeah. Why don't you take from the Oh, that's the reason that we're using that. That likelihood equals tau of tau. This is the test, like part of the test. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to, sometimes we have to specify what your decision is. Um, then the likelihood ratio is exactly equal to that. that soft um, it's not soft thresholding. So it just, um, it's like soft decision. So you have to like yeah. flip a coin. Yeah. Like whenever this happens, like maybe like 70% of the time, I'm going to decide one, 20%. We'll see. This, this is to make sure that you achieve the like, maximum budget that you have for false positive rate. In some cases, if there is a um, like in the speed problem, especially, and then there's like this the distribution of this has like a, a positive mass as a given point. It might not be possible to achieve this alpha. So you can still like um, manage to satisfy this inequality, but we'll see like to, to get the most power, you want to like push this as far as possible. You want to make your like use all your false positive budget. So your these tests, you're going to try to make such that. They're like a false positive rate is like exact, exact, is exactly alpha. Okay. And then the, the true positive rate would be the maximum possible. And to achieve that, sometimes you need the randomization. Oh, I'll talk about that. Any other questions? So there's a formal way of proving it, and there's like a, an informal, but um, 
more illustrative way of proving it. And I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to just give you the illustrative way. Um, I'm going to also write things that P1 and P0 instead of P theta1 and P theta0 for simplicity. So the likelihood ratio is going to be P1 of x divided by P0 of x. And um, the informal way is just uh, looks at this as a regular optimization problem. And uh, if you think of the expectation, these are really linear functionals of so. So this is like a linear problem. So delta x p1 of x dx, and this is integral delta x p0 of x dx. If you think about the integrals, integrals are linear. So is, they're going to be linear in this. So it's a linear programming problem in infinite dimensions. Um, right. Um, and I can do like... Uh, Linear programming is, is, is a very sort of um, nice type of optimization problem. It's like a convex problem. So everything is fine, except that maybe you're in infinite dimensions. But at least you can do like the, the, the traditional approach of doing Lagrange multipliers. Okay. So I can do, um, so I'm not going to write the integrals for simplicity, but um, I have like, um, I'm going to say that the, the maximizer, let's say, uh, the maximizer, um, the delta that maximizes this, uh, is going to maximize um, um, delta x minus uh, some like alpha times. Um, let me write it like this: um, expectation under zero delta x um, minus alpha. Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, write this as expectation under zero of delta x minus alpha less than or equal to zero. And then I'm going to bring it into the objective function by introducing a Lagrange multiplier. So this is the classical approach, Lagrange multiplier. OK, so sort of the theory, like the duality theory, so you can also write it as inf over lambda if you want. There's like a dual version of this problem uh, for, for, for us. The, if, if something solved this, it's going to solve this for some value of lambda. I don't care the exact value, but it has to be a solution of this. So um, the solution that uh, I'm just going to say, the solution of the original problem has to solve the solution of this for some um, lambda. Um, I'm not going to worry about the sign as well that much. So really we have to, because this part is now constant, um, I just have to like maximize. So reduces, reduces to maximize over delta of delta x minus lambda expectation of delta x, because the other part is constant. So um, let's say arg max, I care about the arg max, not the maximum. So arg max would be the same. Um, the argument that maximizes this. So now I'm going to use that property of likelihood ratio. If you remember that it can be used to change the measure, so how are we going to use that? Let's say I want to like move everything under the under P1. So this is expectation under P0. This is expectation under P1. I want to like move everything under um, P1. How can I like rewrite this? E lambda, P1, delta delta. E, can you say that again? E lambda? Oh, the, so lambda is like a scalar. Yeah. But I have to like get the likelihood involved, like the ratio. Right, so this is, if you remember, so rough calculation, this is like delta x. E not that x, if you forget, um, you can just like do a little um, crude calculation here. So let's not worry about the things being zero. So I can divide and multiply by P1 of X. So this would be, um, uh, okay, so that's not what I want to do. Um, let's do the other way. Um, maybe bring the other one because I want to get the other one. So this, this is uh, integral delta X P1 of X dx integral delta x p1 of x divided by p0 of x dx. 
oh, sorry, times p naught of x dx. Now I have integral delta x lx e naught of x dx, which is just the expectation under naught of delta x lx. Okay, that's how we can translate um, this under p1 to this under p naught. Okay, so if you do this, we get arg min, or sorry, arg max. Um, now I'm going to combine the two pieces because they're both under the um, one um, probably distribution. I can just combine the two delta x lx minus lambda uh, delta x, right? That's the expectation. And this further can be written as just let's um, factor out this Lx term minus lambda. Okay. Okay, now it's really easy now to see what the optimal rule has to be because delta x is either one or zero, sort of. Um, so if Lx is equal to lambda, I don't care what happens because this is going to be zero. It doesn't matter what I do here. Um, if, la if Lx is bigger than lambda, what should I do? Set it to be one. Otherwise, if it's zero, it would be smaller. If it's less, strictly less than lambda, I should set it equal to zero because I said it's equal to one, it's going to be bigger. So the optimal rule would be um, the rule that sets this equal to one. If it's bigger than lambda, zero if it's less than lambda. And as far as this goes, what happens here doesn't matter. Does not matter. Um, however, um, you can um, argue that uh, in order to achieve something like this, it would be, it would be, um, necessary but like this type of argument does not give you that but it gives you at least this part okay so you get the structure of the test right um there's a formal way of proving it i'm going to discuss a little bit but, um, this should give you the idea of why like ratios have like come up okay a very simple application of Lagrange multipliers and this change of measure idea using like your ratio. Um, that's the informal proof. So formal statement is something like that. Consider a family of randomized like your ratio tests like this. Um, and usually you write, instead of liking, writing the likelihood ratio, you um, write it like that. Instead of saying this is bigger than T, T here is the threshold instead of lambda. You write it like this to avoid um, division by zero. So this is a little bit more uh, careful way of writing things. One, zero, and then gamma, that's the same thing that we discussed. So the result is saying that for every alpha in zero to one, there exists T and gamma such that um, this holds. Okay. Um, and this is the only place where we use this randomization to achieve that. And then the second part says, if a likelihood ratio test satisfies uh, this condition. So if it looks like this and satisfies this, then it has to be the most powerful test at level alpha. And one part which we're not going to prove is any n most powerful test at level alpha can be written as a likelihood ratio test. So sort of these are the only tests that, that are most powerful. So let's let's talk about uh, A. So in order to so that that's how you actually set the gamma and T, the thresholds and the randomization. Um, in order to set the threshold, what you would do is um, uh, you want to have a certain value of this. Okay, so this um, is an expectation, right? Uh, or you can think of it as um, it's basically so this statement is basically probability under zero that. Um, so it's either one, so this, this quantity is either one or zero. So it's, if it's one, 
Um, so the expectation is going to be one times the probability that this happens. Let's write it like that. Uh, I'm going to write it like this. Lx is equal, like bigger than t. So that's that case. Plus gamma times the probability that uh, this other thing happens, which is Lx equal to t plus zero times the probability that that other case happens, but zero times that goes away. So this is um, this is really the expectation. So this is that expectation here. And so we want to set it equal to alpha. So you can see it all depends on the distribution of uh, Lx on their p naught. So let's um, look at the the basically the complement of the CDF. So let's let's call this GT the CDF of Lx under p. Let's say that's um, yeah. So my notation is not really that great. So z is Lx. This is the CDF of z, and one minus the CDF is really that GT. Okay. So um, that I can figure out. Okay, so you form the likelihood ratio. It's a random variable. It has a distribution under the null. And so it has like a CDF and a complement of the CDF. So if you plot something like that, so people remember what the CDFs look like, right? So what would it look like if I plot this GT as a function of T? It, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's like a second level of detail. So the first level is like, it's going to be monotonically decreasing, sort of. Uh, like from one, the so CDFs are the other way around, but this goes like from one to zero. And if L of X is continuous, right, that's, that's like the, an, a continuous random variable, which means that it has a distribution with the density respect to the Lebesgue measure, then it would look like this. Continuous, one to one, everything nice. And so what happens is, um, I, 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 if you imagine that I set this part to zero, um, what I want is really this part. This is like, this is G of T. So can I say G of T is equal to alpha? Yes, I just have to like set T equal to G minus one alpha. So I'm gonna go for every alpha that I pick here. So let's say I pick alpha to be that. Um, that's my alpha, there's gonna be like, something here, which is G minus one of alpha. That's basically like, like a quantile function, upper quantile function. Okay, so for every alpha, there's gonna be a threshold and I don't need randomization. I can satisfy this bit with gamma equals zero. Okay, um, that's the nice case. Um, but these CDFs have a tendency to be very um, like um, discontinuous or like have flat pieces if, uh, L of X does not have, um, or the distribution does not have density with respect to the vague matter. So for example, if there's a point mass somewhere, so this could go down, and at some point we hit a point, there's like a lump mass here, and then so we have a discontinuity. Um, so they were right continuous or left continuous? Right continuous. Okay, so if, if the CDF is right continuous, then this has to be right continuous as well. Right. So that's right continuous here. Uh, and if we have a situation like this, the problem is, I go further down here, continue my journey towards zero. Okay. So again, in these cases, if if alpha sort of is here, you hit you hit something. If alpha is like here, you hit another point, there is a threshold, you don't need randomization, but it could happen that um, I'm gonna like go here, okay? Alpha is here, so the probability, there's no, there's no um, um, threshold that, that like for which the G of T is equal to. So G of T equal alpha, um, there's no T, no solution, okay? There's no T for it just happens. So if, if I'm here, I'm less than alpha for anything above here, I'm well, like for anything like there, I'm, I'm above alpha. So what should we do here? That's where randomization comes in. Okay, so I'm gonna do this. So this jump is gonna be exactly, so the jump gonna be exactly the probability under zero that L of X is equal to T. Okay, so our threshold is gonna be here. So T is gonna be there. Uh, because if I'm going to go anywhere else, I'm going to get a bigger or smaller alpha. 
So a key is going to be at this jump if alpha like passes true. Um, and then I'm going to choose um, gamma such that sort of account for this part. Okay, so gamma times this probability basically um, plus um, the probability that L of X is bigger than T. Uh, so L of X is bigger than T is, uh, what is that? Um, what value would that be? So it would be like one minus this. Um, uh, so this is like one minus the probability of L of X less than or equal to T. Right. So I would like to say that this is, if I'm not wrong, this is the probability that L of X is bigger than T. Is that correct? Sort of. Which part is it? So this value here. Um, Let's call this A, this is B. So A is gonna be this, okay? And this is gonna be uh, B minus A somehow, if I'm not wrong. Okay, and then I set it equal to alpha and then you can solve for gamma because you can read what alpha and B are. So B is like the limit here. So I'll let you figure the details. But the, the two levels would give you, um, one of them gives you this, the other gives you the, but the difference gives you this, and then you can solve for gamma. Okay. Sort of sounds good. Yeah, and then there are other issues, like I'm gonna let you figure those cases out as well. So you could have a case where this guy like goes down and then hits a flat piece. And you can also have discontinuities, but this is another case. Um, so flat pieces happen. How do these happen? Where's CDI? Yeah. I actually forgot myself, but you can think about this. This could happen as well, right? Um, so it's like cases where like a random variable takes values here, right? And maybe here, right? So the probability that you're below this, um, below this is gonna monotonically increase. And at this point, it's gonna be constant until you like enter this interval, right? So the disjoint interval. And so I'll let you figure out what you should do here. So in this case, when an alpha hits this, I should reset alpha. Um, I believe you don't need randomization, but maybe you need, uh, okay. But this is the main key. The, the key point is that you can't solve, like always solve this equation. So you do the randomization to sort of account for that part, okay? So if 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 you can achieve this, so, so the name appears on this, this is the formal part. If you can achieve basically this, then the proof, um, which I want to let you guys go through yourself, basically start by writing an inequality here. Um, and using the fact that for any other decision rule, um, the significance level is less than alpha, which is equal to our optimal rule, or the, the, the rule that we, we use as like the ratio, you write an inequality which, which always holds because um, this is at most one, this is exactly one when this is bigger than zero, and um, so all the possible cases, all the three cases of the, the sign of this bigger equal to zero and less than zero, this inequality holds for any decision rule in our like, like a ratio, because this sort of is going to be always bigger than this. And then you take the expectation of both sides. And um, or actually integral. So integrate both sides and 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 you rearrange and you, you prove formally that the, the power of this generic rule is less than that. So I let you like go through this. But the, the critical part is that the optimal rule achieves this alpha. So that's why you need um, um, sort of going through, you need to go through this um, rather elaborate construction. So 
Sounds good. So most powerful tests are like this. Um, here's an example. So we do like, um, um, for example, a normal distribution with mean um, theta and variance one, a single observation. We want to test whether theta is equal to theta naught versus theta equal to theta one. Um, you form the likelihood ratio. And um, the idea is, um, so some things cancel out, like the constants um, stuff. And then the likelihood ratio test, LRT, rejects H0 if L of X is bigger than T. Okay, so if I want to write this, I can, um, this is good enough, but usually you can simplify further. So for example, I can take the log of both sides, um, and then I simplify and rearrange everything. And at some point, so I move this to the other side, and then I want to divide by this. When, when you try to divide by this, you have to be careful because if the sign is positive or negative, you're going to change the inequality. So the way I, I wrote it is that I'm going to divide by the absolute value of this. It's going to be positive. Um, so I get a sign here and this. So this I can call a new threshold. Okay, so um, this is how I usually do these uh, problems. Um, I don't care about the original. So this this gives me the structure of the test, and I figure out the structure at this point. So if theta one is bigger than theta naught, I'm gonna declare the alternative if x is bigger than some threshold. Okay, um, and then I can I can decide the value of the threshold by just um, trying to satisfy the. Um, so the, the, at this point, I decided that so let's suppose theta one is bigger than theta naught. So optimal rule is um, delta x is one if x is bigger than tau, zero otherwise, and, and perhaps like some randomization in the middle. In this case, we don't need it um, because um, what, I, what I end up doing is to set the threshold, um, I want to satisfy the probability under null that I declare one, which is x bigger than tau is equal to alpha. And for this, I, I don't need um, any randomization because uh, the distribution of x under null is uh, continuous, which is like Okay, so you, you, you need to invert this. So this is, um, so, so far, so good. Does that make sense? So this is very um, like um, common. So you write the likelihood ratio test and then you try to manipulate. You have to be careful about divisions because you, like, uh, like you can change the sign, but you can move around things. Uh, so you don't have to worry too much about the actual uh, original threshold. But once you get the structure of the test, then you try to set tau by requiring this. And if you do that, it turns out to be this quantity. So let's do this. Um, so Q is like the complement of the CDF. So the Q function from engineering, the CDF of the standard normal. So this is saying that if basically, um, if you have Z, it's normal zero one, then phi of X is just the probability that Z is less than X. And Q of X is just the probability that Z is strictly bigger than X. So that's the Q function. Um, and so, the probability under null that x is bigger than tau, I can write x under null as like theta zero plus z. Okay. And so this would be p um, theta naught plus z bigger than tau. We probably the z is bigger than tau minus theta naught, which is q tau minus theta naught. So I'm going to set this equal to alpha. And if you solve, you get that. Uh, tau minus theta naught should be Q inverse of alpha. Okay, and then tau has to be theta naught plus Q inverse of alpha. And similarly, you can do the calculation for the power, but, but at this point you're done because you have figured out the, the likelihood or the, the optimal test. But if someone asks you for the power, uh, you're just gonna calculate this event, the same event under P1, um, again, X1 minus theta one, uh, is bigger than tau minus theta one. Now this this is standard normal under P one, so this would be Q of tau minus theta one. Um, 
And if I want to plot the sort of the trade-off between uh, the false positive rate and true positive rate, I can just plug in tau from here to this equation. Uh, if you eliminate basically tau, you get this, this expression. So plug in tau here, you get Q of um, theta naught minus theta one plus Q minus one of alpha. So here I'm, I'm writing this as delta equal theta one minus theta naught. And so it's going to be minus delta plus Q minus one of alpha. So this delta tells you like how difficult the problem. Um, if, if delta is zero, there is no way to tell them apart. So you get Q T versus beta is equal to alpha. So the, the care would look like this if you plug beta versus alpha. So that would be your, that's the bad ROC. So it's called the like receiver uh, operating characteristic. So the performance here would be like, if I plot this curve in general for a, for a delta, um, this is alpha, this is beta. So that's that's the curve that I get. That's like um, beta equals Q minus delta plus Q inverse of alpha. Okay, this is the ROC of the, um, basically this family of tests. So you can think of this as a, give you a family of tests, one for each alpha. Okay, so if I change alpha, I have to change the threshold, but but you can think of this as uh, once I set the threshold, I now have a family of tests. It says one if um, X is bigger than the threshold is theta zero plus Q minus one of alpha, uh, zero otherwise, okay? So this is a, this is a family parameter for alpha, and once I have it, then you can make uh, and this this family has the property the pro the um, the um, sort of false positive rate is, is like is like exactly alpha the way we constructed it. Okay, um, and then the the beta for this family would be what I um, stated. Okay, would be that that thing u minus delta. Um, u minus one of alpha. So you plot it. Um, the name of Pearson's sort of idea is that this is the best is it, that, that, that's achievable. Okay, so if you pick alpha here, um, no other test can achieve a power bigger than this value. Okay, nothing here is achievable, no matter what you do, and and so on and so forth. So this is like how how hard the problem is. So this gives you the upper limit, and if delta is bigger, so this is going to become sharper and sharper. Okay. So the ideal situation is if you have something like that, which, which is not achievable in general, but if you let delta go to infinity, you'd approach that. If you let delta approach to zero, you'd approach this. So this tells you like the, like completely so that the, as you can imagine that the difficulty is completely characterized by delta and exact nature of the difficulty is like by this curve. So that's the, um, like, so it is like if delta is really big, then deciding whether the parameter means false it's easier. It's easier if they're really far apart. Yes, yes, yes. And I guess here we have like parameters as a same value, but could you do like a divergence if you have like you know a subset of parameter space as opposed to a single? Um, the, so this, the general idea that we had works in general, but you have to write down the likelihood ratio. Test and figure out what that like the implications, right? You don't need a special divergence. This is the solution. And like the ratio test figure it or something and then manipulate it, that would be the optimal thing. Uh, usually people here in this case would, would plot these. Um, I encourage you to do this uh, in the interest of time. I'm not gonna do it. This is one, the other with this density is this. So if they're further apart, so the overlap smaller, if they're closer. And you can um, see, like, you, you're going to have a threshold here. You put a threshold somewhere, like the tail of one would be, like, this part would be uh, false positive rate, and this part would be the true positive rate, okay? And then as you vary, sort of this is going to change, okay? Um, and this is the ROC here. Uh, but I'm, I'm assuming that these are easy to figure out for you, so... Um, Sounds good. And there's another example. Oh, there's no another another example. So okay, so let's talk about the composite case rather quickly. 
So what happens if I have a composite case? Um, so omega naught and omega one are now sets, and the intersection is like empty. Uh, for example, if you test uh, want to test whether if coin is fair, uh, you take this to be um, omega naught to be one half. You may take this part, um, the alternative to be anything but one half. Um, so here, similar to the idea of uniformly most uh, minimum variance unbiased case. So you can think of like so how to extend these ideas of most powerful tests. And, and like a desirable property would be something like that, a test that is uniform means powerful um, in the sense that for any test, other test at level alpha, which means that the maximum power is, uh, or maximum that power function over the um, null parameters, which is alpha. And for every test that satisfies this, um, the test under consideration has a bigger power for every single theta under the alternative. Like point wise dominates the power function point wise dominates the power function of any other candidates at L, like candidate as L. Then it's called uniform the most powerful. It's like uniform domination that you've seen. Um, so if, if a test like that exists, then it's called uniform the most powerful UMP. And unfortunately, these don't often exist. Um, um, but in some cases, you can find them. And the way to find them is by actually following like, the prescription that we had. And um, for example, in this case, um, when you go through the argument, you realize that um, the structure of the optimal test does not depend um, on the exact value of theta naught or theta one. It just matters whether theta one is bigger than theta naught or not. Okay, so because this tau, you can see, um, okay, it's determined by theta naught, but it has nothing to do with theta one. Okay, so let's say I fix theta one, and um, this for any for any theta one that I put here, this test is going to be the most powerful test, right? There's no theta one in it. It achieves this alpha is the likelihood ratio test between the um, yeah, with maybe that, that alternative and any other theta one. So this tells you that this is really uniformly most powerful for testing theta equal theta naught versus um, theta bigger than theta one. No, no, sorry, theta bigger than theta naught. So if I if my alternative is theta bigger than theta naught for any particular theta which is bigger than theta naught, let's say theta one. I'm going to do the analysis of Neyman Pearson and I arrive at the same test. Okay, because it's the same test that works for every little theta there. Um, it has to be UMP for this case. Okay. Um, if you follow along this uh, like reasoning, um, you can also see that um, so delta x x bigger than Theta naught plus Q inverse of alpha, zero otherwise, this is UMP for this. Um, if I have um, another problem, which is um, H naught is theta equal theta naught, this is called one sided test, like hypothesis testing problem. This is two, two sided. So the alternative is saying either theta is bigger than theta naught or theta is less than theta naught, but not exactly equal to theta. So either theta naught, either we are equal to theta naught under null, or you're not equal to theta naught. Uh, the Bernoulli example for a coin is like this. So if, if it's like that, then um, you can argue that there is no UMP test. Why there is no UMP test? Let's see if people can see it. Because theta one minus theta one is SID and it's very good. Can you say that again? The sign of theta one minus theta. Yeah, so because exactly because of this sign flip here. So if if you look at any like um, what you're gonna do is like start from that simple hypothesis testing. If theta one is bigger than theta naught, I go through this argument, I get 
uh, that the optimal test is going to declare one and x is bigger than tau for some threshold, but it depends on theta naught. If theta one is less than theta naught, I'm going to go through this. And because of the sign being negative, when I like multiply by sign, I get x less than tau. So uh, for what happens is that for any um, theta one, which is less than theta naught, uh, this test is going to be optimal. One, if x is less than tau, like tau prime for some tau, and then zero otherwise. Okay, so the structure of the optimal test changes. So you have to like reject for smaller values of x. If theta one is bigger than theta, you have to reject for bigger values of x. So it's very clear that these two tests are very different. You can't have a single test that rejects both like when you're big and when you can't have it, but this is saying, um, so you can imagine you can like have an interval and say, I'm gonna like reject outside it. That's possible, but this is saying that you have to have a single threshold, either reject all above or reject all below. And these two tests are not, like you can't reconcile them. And so most powerful test is different for each of the two regions. So there is no single uniformly most powerful test. There are two different UMT tests for these two different um, sub, let's say, like two sided tests. So there is no universal UMT test for this two sided test. Okay. So that's that's how you can reason about these problems. Um, questions? It's a little bit tricky, but um, if you go through this, you realize that. Um, once you write down the most powerful test, the threshold depends on only on the um, the null hypothesis because that's how you say it. Like evaluating um, the test under the null hypothesis has nothing to do with the alternative, and the alternative doesn't come into the picture. Only comes into picture in terms of whether it's bigger than theta naught or less than theta naught, and that's how you can determine whether you have a UMP test or not. Okay. Um, and you can go through um, the same argument. I'm not going to repeat this for, for the Bernoulli case. Uh, for the Bernoulli case, the issue is like setting the threshold is a little bit more tricky. You, you write down the likelihood ratio, so you have the exact, like the likelihood ratio would be something like that. The density is going to be probably the mass functions. And um, you can see that if you, if theta one is bigger than one half, you're going to, Rejects when x is bigger than tau because it's like binomial. Um, if x is less than tau, you, sorry, if, if theta one is less than one half, you reject when x is less than tau. It's very um, natural. So if, if you're testing a fair coin against something which is like as as a probability of uh, coming up heads, heads which is less than one half, then you have to reject when things are small. If you're like testing against something which has a probably higher probability than one half, you have to reject when things are big. So these these are not reconcilable for the criteria. And so there is no UMP test. Uh, in this case, there is there is a like a, a one-sided UMP test as well, similar to the Yaoshin case. And uh, this happens in general for for families that have the so-called monotone likelihood ratio property. So and like we can do it in general for an exponential family. So the idea is that if you have um, a parametric family of densities, and you'd say that this has a monotone likelihood ratio in some statistic T of X, um, if whenever theta naught is less than theta one, when you write down the likelihood ratio, it's a non-increasing function of this statistic. Okay, it's very similar to what, what we did. So the likelihood ratio in the Gaussian case was um, like a like a an increasing function of x, so that x would 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 satisfy this like it is a witness to this property. And um, in in those cases, basically the idea is that you would have like a one sided U of test uh, by the sort of just formalizing what we just did. Uh, and so you can do this, you can verify this criteria for for a general exponential family, P of x being uh, it's sufficient statistic if you form the likelihood ratio of this, you can see that it's going to be like the monotone function of this. Um, if, for example, whenever theta naught is less than or equal to theta one, um, theta of theta naught is less than or equal to theta of theta one, or vice versa. 
Um, so basically, if theta is monotone, this parameterization is monotone in theta, then you have a monotone like a ratio of TLX. Or you can say negative TLX. So being part, like increasing or decreasing doesn't matter because you can just flip the sign of TLX. Um, and so Bernoulli, for example, is a case, like one of the cases, normal as well, Poisson, exponential, these all have monotone parameterization. So you have monotone like the ratio property. So you'd have one sided UMP test. So the formal statement, uh, okay, this is an example which is non exponential family. I'm going to let you guys uh, go over it. It's not difficult. Um, no. I thought I had a formal statement. Yeah, okay. So that's the formal statement. Um, if you have a family of um, um, probability distribution with monotone like racial property in T of X and consider the one sided um, test, you can also like um, do this like that. So not, not exactly theta naught, theta less than or equal to theta naught, and theta is pretty bigger than theta naught. Testing whether you're below this or above this. Then there is this UMP test of size alpha, which would look like um, this, basically thresholding the T of X um, at a value C, and then perhaps randomizing to achieve that, that um, sort of um, um, size. You're going to try to work, like um, fix the size at theta naught. Okay, so that's the. Um, you're going to try to make sure that t of delta x equal to one. Sorry, not delta. Okay, we have to just write it as expectation theta naught delta x uh, at theta naught at that so boundary point. You want it to exactly have um, this or satisfy this this uh, size criteria or significance level criteria. But, but you can go through the proof. The proof is basically just a, like a formal way of writing what we did. Okay, so you just write down the likelihood ratio. You, you know that if you pick a fixed theta one and it's bigger than, say, than theta one, so fixed theta one bigger than theta naught, you, you argue that the most powerful test has to look like this. But then you manipulate it, you see that the structure looks like that, and it has nothing to do with theta one. And, and these, these parameters are just set by, by what happens at theta naught. Um, and so you have a UMP test. So do this as an exercise, and you're gonna skip this. This is another example where you have a one-sided UMP test. It's it's that example that's not a, an exponential family, but just so you can verify, you can write down um, the, the likelihood, and you would have a, a MLR property in the maximum. So it would have a one-sided UMP test. And these are the, like the ROCs and power functions. Okay, so in the remaining like maybe few minutes, I just want to point out that, so you don't have UMP tests in general for two-sided tests. What should we do? Uh, again, we have like different options. One option is to restrict the class of tests to which we compare. Uh, so there's a notion of unbiasedness of tests, uh, which we unfortunately don't get to talk about, but I have talked about this last year. You managed to talk about it like the last lecture, probably. You can check YouTube videos if you're interested. And the other more general approach, so if you, if you restrict yourself to class unbiased test, then um, oftentimes there is a UMP unbiased. But there is a more general approach, which is this generalized like your ratio test, uh, which is a very nice general way of obtaining this. So the idea is um, I would um, try um, to basically maximize the likelihood here and maximize the likelihood here, find the maximum likelihood um, parameters, and then compare the ratios of the um, the likelihood, basically at the maximum likelihood in each case. Okay, um, this is a slight modification. You don't have to like do these two separately. You can do like find the maximum likelihood over this and find the maximum likelihood over the whole space. So that's how usually people work uh, or like write these statistics. It's easier because um, so th that's what you do. So take the maximum of the likelihood over the uh, entire parameter space, omega is the union basically. And then divide this by the maximum of um, the likelihood over the um, 
uh, null parameter state. Um, the reason why you write it like that is because um, this generally would be unconstrained problem. It's easy, the usual maximum likelihood. This one, this one will be uh, like a constrained problem often. So if, if theta hat is the uh, unrestricted MLE, and theta hat naught is the restricted MLE, like MLE restricted to omega naught, then it's just the ratio of these quantities, okay? This turns out to be between one and infinity because obviously maximizing over a bigger set makes things bigger. So this is always gonna be at least one. Um, and the idea is that if you're close to one, uh, you're not gonna reject. If you're very large, you're gonna reject. So um, uh, G GLRT or generalized likelihood ratio test rejects if this quantity L of X is bigger than some lambda, and alternatively, you can look at the log of this. Usually people look at the log L of X or two log L of X. So you reject if this is bigger than some threshold and again, possibly randomize to achieve a certain um, level. So you want to, to put maximum over um, omega naught of the power function of the alpha. That's how you set the thresholds. Um, so I'm gonna talk about why this makes sense, but this, yeah. When you say that I'll reject when uh, the L of X is larger, how large? Uh, exactly this large. So you set it such that this is the, you achieve a certain alpha level of alpha, right? Exactly like the. So you need to compute that and then make it. Yes, you need to like, you, you have to, um, um, let's say usually what, what happens is like the cases that we care about is like this is um, the null is simple. The alternative is the problematic one, like the cases that, that are two-sided. So this is just going to be, the, there's just one element, just expectation theta naught. So you do exactly the calculations that we did. So this is going to give you it's like some statistic. Um, oftentimes the statistic is like continuous with respect to the regular. So that you don't need randomization, you just said uh, like this, so probably that under theta naught is like that this is bigger than tau is equal to alpha and that the term is the tau, right? And in fact, there is like a, um, so maybe like the last minute I'm gonna talk about this. This converges in general to like a chi-squared as the sample size grows. So you really, like if you are okay with uh, as in Tadix, you don't really need to do any work, basically. And if you do properly, that's just why actually they look at two log L of X. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe like the last minute. This, just the rationale behind this, why this works is, um, uh, so the idea is very quickly, you have like omega naught and then omega one and the entire thing. So there is gonna be some, um, let's say some, uh, true parameter. So if the true parameter is in the omega one, let's say that's the true parameter, um, you, you can compute the unrestricted MLE. So the unrestricted MLE as the sample size grows approaches this. Okay. On the other hand, um, the restricted MLE, this guy um, cannot approach this because this is in the alternative and you restrict yourself and you optimize for the restricted one to the omega naught. So this is gonna approach to something on the boundary which is closest to this guy. And because of this gap cannot be like, um, this gap cannot be uh, filled as emphatically, you're gonna have a large likelihood ratio. The ratio is of like, whatever likelihood is here versus here, assuming your model is good. Whereas if um, if you're on the alter, like under the null, uh, both of these guys, so that this is the true parameter. So unrestricted and restricted both can converge to this. So eventually that likelihood ratio is gonna um, approach one, right? Because both of them get close to the same parameter. So under the null, this can approach uh, one and then the alternative it's gonna approach um, um, like something positive. So you get a good power. Um, so you can do this like, interesting stuff happens if you do it in examples. So just one last point is this, this result that if you, this is for a very simple case where omega naught, for example, is um, um, like this. So um, like you have like a, let's say D dimensional parameter and 
the null sets the, the first R elements to zero, the rest are free. Okay, um, so you have R constraints, basically. The, the, the number of constraints you put on the null you, or, or on the parameter to get the null is R. So in, in that case, um, under the null, under the like assumptions that guarantee as entitling normality of the MLEs, all the regularity assumptions that we had, and assuming that omega is open, um, this converges to chi squared with ad, the, that many degrees of freedom. You don't need this very special case. This is sort of the case where it's easy to calculate. You can have a very complicated setting. The thing is like locally things would look like this. Locally things are going to be linear. So like things would like um, locally you can like fit like a imagine like you can linearize the complicated manifold. Um, so locally things would look like that. So in general, what this R is is like the the, the degree of freedom this guy squared is the difference between basically um, uh, the local dimensions of the full and and no parameter spaces. Because the full parameter space, like in this case, is R D dimension local and global is D. This guy is locally looks like uh, a D minus R dimensional space because you have this many constraints and the difference is going to be there. So in general, it would be the difference between the local dimensions of the constraint and the global parameter. So this, this is a fairly general result. Uh, there is a proof in Hiener. Um, and I also have like a hand wavy proof, like two page proof for this very simple case if you're interested. Okay, so unfortunately we don't get to talk about examples and p-values, but I think this is a good place to stop. Okay, so this gives you a very nice general um, way to compute, um, like calculate like a pain test for, for complex hypothesis. Any questions? Okay, uh, very nice um, um, teaching you guys or like lecturing to you guys and thanks for attending the class. Uh, like good luck on the final. And I guess see you guys around.